Hi everybody, this is Mr. Zoller and I'm here to present you a screencast video today on the South and we're going to be looking at what the South looked like uh, right before the start of the American Civil War in 1860. So just like we were doing with the North, we're going to start by looking at the geography of the South. Uh, so for the southern part of the United States, the climate's going to be much different. It's going to be uh, a warmer area, uh, so the winters aren't going to be quite as harsh as they are up north. The summers are going to be longer which means in the end there's going to be a longer growing season where you, where you can grow more plants. Uh, there's also a lot of rainfall in the area, uh, so with that plus the weather, it's going to be ideal uh, location for agriculture and farming. Uh, near the coastline, you're going to have the coastal uh, lowlands, which means that they'll periodically flood, and there's a lot of nutrients that are brought in uh, into the soil, uh, lots of rivers in the south as well. Uh, so because of the weather, because of the amount of rain that it receives, because of the rich soil, the south, as it started in the 13 colonies, is going to be great for growing cash crops, uh, starting with tobacco, rice, indigo, and sugar, and eventually, as we're going to see, uh, cotton becoming the main crop in the south. Uh, we're also going to have in the south, there are some forests, so that's going to be used for lumber, uh, being used for different things that are needed in the southern part of the United States and most of the towns and cities are going to be located or nearby rivers since agriculture and farming is essential in the south for their economy uh, people are going to live nearby where transportation goes in and out and also access to fresh water which is needed for the crops and so like this picture down here the capital of virginia richmond virginia here in 1863 uh, which is during the american civil war uh, next to the james river um, and a lot of the southern cities are going to be located next to rivers for the economy of the South, it's going to be focused on agriculture, uh, growing crops, and there's also going to be a demand and need for slaves. So up to about 1790, slavery was actually on the decline in the South. Uh, not as many slaves are being needed to grow tobacco, rice, indigo, and sugar. Um, and then in 1793, we're going to have an introduction of a new uh, invention called the cotton gin, and gin is short for engine by Eli Whitney. And he was hoping that by creating this invention that it would uh, end up decreasing the need for slaves. Um, and, and that was his hope. However, that's going to kind of backfire uh, with that invention. Uh, for cotton, it becomes the chief crop of the South. And that's going to be because the cotton gin is going to allow slaves to clean uh, the cotton a lot quicker. So it used to be that it would take one slave a whole day to clean about one pound of cotton. And now with the cotton gin, uh, they're able to clean at least 50 pounds a day. So you're able to do the work of 50 people uh, with just having one of these machines. And so that's going to cause cotton uh, to become very valuable uh, since it wasn't that valuable before because it took so long to clean. And we're also going to have in the northern part of the United States, since we have the textile industry where they're making clothing, and then back in uh, England, they're also creating clothing there. So there's a high demand for cotton. And so now, since cotton is much easier to clean and get the seeds and fibers out, it's going to be a very valuable crop, and it's going to spread across the South. And in return, it's also going to lead to an increase in slavery. Uh, now, cotton is a very um, demanding crop, so it does take a lot of out of the soil. Uh, so farmers are going to continue to move out west as the land becomes infertile and has to rest for a few years before they could grow cotton again. And so as the United States is gaining more land through Manifest Destiny, heading out west into Texas and Louisiana Territory, cotton is going to spread that way along with slavery. And so from 1790 to 1850, uh, the demand of slaves is going to dramatically increase from 500,000 now to 3 million. And all because, I mean, we can kind of connect it back to the cotton gin that Eli Whitney created and the need for slaves to work on the land. So you can see the impact of the cotton gin here on the south. So this represents the slave population. So here in 1800, you can see that there is a little bit of slavery in the north, and most of it's located around Maryland, uh, Delaware, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and a little bit in Kentucky. And now jump ahead 60 years, and you can just see the explosion in uh, slavery across the west here. And here's the Mississippi River, and you can see that along its whole path uh, it's going to be lots of slaves around those, those areas where the rivers are located. And you'll find the same pattern here. So for cotton production in 1801, not that much. 
and because of the cotton gin it's going to explode in growth and head to the west heading westward during this in the south here and where cotton goes slavery is going to follow for transportation in the south their main form of transportation is going to be their natural rivers that they have uh, river boats uh, once we have steam power is going to allow southerners to ship their cotton and people across uh, upstream downstream on rivers and you're going to have these steamships just piled high with cotton bales to be sent to the northern cities to make into clothing or to send across to England across the Atlantic uh, for the same reasons there and so cotton is going to become a very valuable uh, product uh, cotton is going to make up about 60 percent of the entire uh, gross national product for the United States which means the United States is income is going to come 60 percent of it's coming just from cotton alone uh, so the southerners that are growing cotton have a lot of land for it are going to become the wealthiest americans in the united states um, if you lived west of the appalachian mountains the mississippi river was going to be the way you would transport your cotton and if we remember correctly from class remember that's one of the reasons we sent um, james monroe or jefferson sent james monroe to france to negotiate about buying the city of new orleans so we would have a way to transport all of our crops for the farmers west of the Appalachians. And this is a picture here showing New Orleans. So you can see a very busy port and we have, you can see lots of different cotton bales that are being loaded and other things as well. And there are some railroads in the south, but they're not connected really well together. Rivers are the main way that people get around and transport um, their goods. And the south by the beginning of the Civil War is only gonna have about half of the amount of railroad tracks as the north is going to have. Uh, finally for the southern society so the south is going to be dominated by white southerners at the very top of the social pyramid you're going to have the wealthy plantation owners who own these huge areas of land and they're going to dominate everything in economics and politics and lawmaking uh, and most of the time their sons are going to be uh, following in their father's footsteps going to college uh, daughters are going to become wives of other uh, wealthy men and about one in four whites in the South would own slaves, so about 25% of them. And then of that 25%, you have about 10% that own around 90% of all the slaves in the South. Uh, so slaves are very expensive. Only about a quarter of the whites in the South own slaves. And then of that quarter, about 10% own 90% of all the slaves in the South. Um, a majority of whites in the South were poor. They worked on their own fields or they worked for somebody else, a uh, plantation owner on their fields and got paid for it and 10% were too poor to own their own land, so they're gonna be working for somebody else. So most whites in the South were very poor and did not own any slaves. For African Americans in the South, it's going to be a struggle uh, for them, uh, no doubt about it. Uh, while in the North, African Americans are free, uh, there are a very limited amount of free African Americans in the South, and those that live there um, have hard hardships that they have to face. They're forced to wear badges to prove they're not slaves. They pay extra taxes. They're not allowed to live on the land that slaves are on since Southerners do not want to have free African-Americans trying to free slaves. And the reason why you have African-Americans staying in the South is many that are now free. Uh, they have family that are slaves and they don't want to leave their, their family there. And so it's very difficult for them. For the vast majority of African-Americans in the South though, they will be slaves. Uh, so by 1860, we have a couple million African Americans that are slaves, and by slaves, they're, they're somebody's property. They have no rights at all, and most are going to be working in the fields, uh, picking cotton or other crops, working in the homes, and there'll be some that are skilled. And the Southerners created many, many laws, uh, making sure that uh, African Americans that are slaves, that they're not going to be able to get any education against the law to read and to write and there were very few laws protecting uh, the slaves. Well, that's a general information you'll need to know about the South before the Civil War, and this is Mr. Zoller. Have a great day. See you all later.